Dietmar Hall's permanent magnet motor. If you would like to make a simple motor of this type, then the information provided by Dietmar Hall, passed to me by Jess Ascanius of Denmark, shows you how. He uses 20 mm diameter round neodymium magnets 10 mm thick. Stacked in pairs in the stator of this layout. Permanent Magnet V Accelerator Field Designed by Dietmar Hall April 6, 2007 Neodymium Magnetis 20 mm in diameter 10 mm thick This shows a magnetic gate arrangement built on a flat piece of medium density fiberboard 30 mm thick The holes drilled in it are 20.1 mm in diameter and positioned so as to take two of the 10 mm thick magnets stacked together the holes are drilled at an angle of 63 degrees to the horizontal or 27 degrees to the vertical, whichever way you prefer to think of it. On one side of the board, the inserted magnets have their north poles facing upwards, while on the other side of the board, the magnets are inserted with their south poles facing upwards. Dietmar shows six holes to take bolts or screws to fasten the piece of MDF to a larger board or table. Those do not form any part of the magnetic system and can be omitted. A video of one version of it in action can be found at http colon slash slash www.fre-energy-info.tux.nlvtrack.mpg The gate operates by causing a stack of 10 of the magnets to roll along the V-shaped track and pass smoothly across the junction with the next set of V-positioned magnets. There can be as many of these V-sets as you want and the magnet stack will still keep rolling. This is one of the few magnetic gate designs which adapts to drum operation as a motor rotor. The magnets are positioned at an angle in order to use the magnetic fields at the edge of the magnets. They are stacked in pairs in order to increase their power. The power of the motor depends on the strength of the magnets. How close the stator magnet stacks are to the VF track magnets and the number of stacks of stator magnets. If you decide to construct one of these motors, then it is suggested that you make things easier for yourself by keeping the curvature low, using three or four of the versus. With Dietmar's dimensions, a 2V drum would be 216.5 mm, 85, in diameter, a 3V drum would have a 325 mm, 12.8, diameter and a 4V drum a diameter of 433 mm, 17, and those dimensions include the 30 mm, 13-16, strip which holds the magnets, so the inner drum diameters are 30 mm less in each case. When making the motor drum, it is possible to use a flexible material to hold the magnets. This allows the strip to be laid out flat while the holes are drilled, and then attached to the outside of a rigid drum with a 60 mm lesser diameter than the ones mentioned above. Jessica Nyus of Denmark shows how a jig can be made to make drilling the holes easier. This one has had a length of copper pipe inserted at the correct angle, in order to direct the drill bit at the exact angle required. This motor has been successfully replicated by Jess Ascanius of Denmark who used 10 mm magnets which were to hand, and again with square magnets which were pushed into round holes and not even angled in this proof of concept implementation which only took one hour to build using scrap material to hand, and which did work. With Dietmar's design using angles magnet pairs, the number of magnets needed is quite high. For a single V, there are 58 magnets. For a 2V version, 106 magnets. For a 3V version, 154 magnets and for a 4V version. 202 magnets if there is only one stack of stator magnets, so 10 extra magnets need to be added to the count for each additional 10 magnet stack of stator magnets. The motor power is likely to increase as the diameter increases as the lever arm that the magnet has to turn the drum, increases double the diameter to, almost, double the power. Simple permanent magnet motors. It is very difficult to use the power of permanent magnets to make a motor powered by them alone. The Dietmar Hall design shown above is one of the very few which can readily be made and tested at home. The problem is that almost all magnets have a symmetrical magnetic field, while what is needed for a magnet-powered motor is an asymmetrical magnetic field. Consequently, 
magnets have to be combined in ways which distort their normal field shape. You will notice that in the Hall motor, the drive magnets are angled and that is an important feature of using magnets in motors. Schools currently teach that the field surrounding a bar magnet is like this. Permanent magnet. Lines of magnetic force. This is deduced by scattering iron filings on a sheet of paper held near the magnet. Unfortunately, that is not a correct deduction as the iron filings distort the magnetic field by their presence, each becoming a miniature magnet in its own right and alters the magnetic properties of the space around the magnet in the plane of the iron filings. More careful measurement shows that the field actually produced by a bar magnet is like this. There are many lines of force, although these diagrams show only two of them. In reality, the lines of force at the corners fan out in three dimensions, with curved, circular flowing lines above the, the top of the magnet, circular lines below the lower face of the magnet. These lines of force are roughly in the shape of a football with the corner of the magnet in the center of the football. Actually, there are many layers of these lines of magnetic force, so it is like having a whole series of gradually bigger and bigger footballs all centered on the corner of the magnet. It is extremely difficult to draw those lines and show them clearly. Howard Johnston's book The Secret World of Magnets will give you a good idea of the actual lines of force around a bar magnet. The arrangement of these lines of magnetic force is not generally known and if you google magnetic lines of force images you will only find the fiction taught in schools. However, the important fact is that there is a rotating magnetic field at each corner of a typical bar magnet. It follows then that if a row of magnets is placed at a, an angle, then there will be a resulting net field in a single direction. For example, if the magnets are rotated 45 degrees clockwise, then the result would be like this. Net magnetic force. With this arrangement, the opposing corners of the magnets as shown here, are lower down and so there should be a net magnetic force pushing to the right just above the set of magnets. However, the situation is not as simple and straightforward as you might imagine. The additional lines of magnetic force which have not been shown in the diagram above, act further out from the magnets and they interact, creating a complex composite. Magnetic field. It is frequently found that after four or five magnets that a short gap needs to be left before the line of magnets is continued on. Two boys, Anthony and Andreas, have used this magnet arrangement to create a magnetic track and they have a lot of fun, sending a magnet sliding between two of these rows of angled magnets. Initially, they used the cheaper ceramic magnets and got a very satisfactory movement when using a neodymium magnet as the moving component. You will notice that they have managed a row of 18 ceramic magnets on each side of their track and the results which they are getting are very good. They have three videos on the web at the present time. The moving magnet is made up of 4 12 mm times 12 mm times 12 mm, or half inch by half inch by half inch, neodymium magnets attached north, south, north, south, north, south, north, south. They have not disclosed all of the details of what they are using, accidentally rather than by intention. The ceramic stator magnets are 48 mm times 20 mm times 10 mm with the poles on each of the main faces. They position each magnet with its north pole facing towards the track and they angle the magnets at 45 degrees. There is a 15 mm gap between the stator magnets and the moving magnets on both sides of the track. Wooden strips direct the moving magnets. Neodymium magnets have very different characteristics to those of ceramic magnets, and that is not just strength of the magnetic field. It is not unusual for experimenters to find that devices will work well with one type of magnet but not with the other type. Here the developers have also tried using two sets of five angled neodymium magnets on each side of their track and the result was a more powerful thrust on their moving magnets. The magnets are held in place in this picture, by wooden dowels driven into the base plank. They used these in order to avoid any magnet fastening material which could alter the magnetic field. The next step would be for them to power a motor using their magnetic track technique. However, 
this has been tried many times and the conclusion is that it is very hard to change a straight magnetic track into one which forms a complete circle. Therefore, I would suggest the following arrangement. Bearing. Rotor shaft. Rotor disc. Rotor magnets. Angled stator magnets. Magnet on underside of the disc. Here, a simple disc rotor has four magnets, of the type used to move down the magnetic track, attached to the underside of the disc and positioned so that they move through four short sets of four, or at the outside, five. Angled stator magnets as the disc spins. It does not matter if the rotor shaft is horizontal or vertical. If the disc spins well, then sets of two air core pickup coils can be positioned between each of the stator magnet arrays so that electricity is generated as the rotor magnets pass by overhead. If a constructor decides to attach two rotor discs to the one rotor shaft, then the two rotors should be positioned so that the rotor shaft gets pushed every 45 degrees of rotation rather than every 90 degrees as shown here. This style of motor is definitely within the scope of the average person to build should they be inclined to do so. I have been asked to say how I personally would go about constructing a prototype of this nature. As I have very limited constructional skills, I would do it like this, for the bearing, I would pick a computer cooling fan, as these have very good bearings and if one is not to hand. Inside an old, obsolete computer, then they can be bought very, very cheaply. The diameter of the fan is not important. These fans generally look something like this. As the part of the fan which spins round does not normally project above the stationary frame, a spacing disc of wood or plastic is needed to provide the clearance. The disc is glued to the center of the fan using perhaps impact of O-stick, epoxy resin or super glue. It would then look like this. A square of wood can then be screwed to the spacer, like this. And as I am hopeless at creating good quality mechanical devices, I would then hold a pencil very steadily against a support and give the wood a spin, so that the pencil draws a perfect circle exactly centered on the bearing of the fan. Then, marking the wood and the spacer so that there is no doubt as to which way round the wood is attached to the spacer, I would unscrew the wood and cut around the pencil line very carefully, smoothing the edges of the disc gently with fine sandpaper. Screwing the disc back in place, a spin should confirm that the edge of the disc stays steadily in place with no wavering of the edge. Actually, if the disc is not perfect, that is not a major problem as it is the rotor magnets which need to be positioned accurately, and for that, another pencil line can be produced by spinning the disc when the desired position has been determined. Permanent magnets vary enormously in size and strength, so when magnets are purchased, it is a matter of testing them using a track of the type used by Anthony and Andreas. The stator magnets are angled at about 45 degrees to the track and with just four on each side, it is a case of finding the spacing between the two sets of angled magnets which pushes the stator magnets furthest along the track.